Hey guys, and welcome to the ninth edition of Lunch Hour. Lunch Hour is a conversation series exploring the boundaries of high performance. My name is Chris Sparks. I'm the founder of The Forcing Function, and I'm your host for today. Forcing Function, we offer executive performance training. We teach executives and investors how to multiply their output, improve their decision making, and perform at optimal levels. If you'd like to learn more, I'd encourage you to check out our free workbook online titled Experiment Without Limits. You can find that at forcingfunction.com slash workbook. We also offer a performance assessment, a free quiz where, we'll, where we will reveal your biggest opportunity to improve your levels of productivity and performance. You can take that for free at forcingfunction.com slash assessment. If you enjoy today's lunch hour, we encourage you to sign up for our monthly newsletter where we share upcoming events with amazing guests like Garrett today. And that guest, Garrett, I am incredibly honored to introduce. Um, for those of you guys who've been, you know, on living under a rock, or maybe you're just less familiar with the poker world, um, those who are familiar know that Garrett is without a doubt one of the best no limit hold'em players in the world today, particularly in the live arena. I think of him as just a complete force of nature at the table. He's really known for his creative and aggressive style of play. You might've seen him as he's a fixture on poker's largest televised cash games, such as Live at the Bike and Poker After Dark. Uh, Garrett and, and I met through a good friend, David Malka, shout out to David. Um, Garrett's just one of my favorite people to see whenever I'm on the West Coast, and this is truly an honor and a privilege to have him on the show today. I think that Garrett's superpower is just his really, really rigorous style of thought. Uh, I think that he's just really proficient at taking ideas to their logical conclusion. You can see by the way that he thinks today why he's so tough to outwit at the tables, not someone that you want to be trying to go deeper into a topic. But I think more, most importantly, he's an incredibly good human being, which those of you guys who play in the high stakes poker world know is a bit of a rarity, that there's this notion that you have to be absolutely you know, ruthless, relentless. And I think Garrett is a great example of why this is not the case. Um, he's been very public about um, the battles that he's had with depression and he's helped hundreds of people with their private struggles. Um, he's someone who is genuinely likable, someone that you actually want in your games, which is a real thing um, when you're playing in the live scene. And you know, I think that he is kind of the rare combination of successful and happy. So successful by cultural terms, someone who's done very well for himself, but there are a lot of people out there who've been very successful who you wouldn't necessarily wanna change places with. So he is somehow be able to pull off this rare combination, both doing very well and being very happy for it. So you know, today's topic, we're gonna to explore what I call the meta skills of high stakes poker, where we try to differentiate what separates the top 1% in a field from the top 0.01%. This is not just how do you get good, this is how do you become the absolute top of your profession where there are lots of conventional ways to improve yourself. And in poker, this is especially true where there's tons of debates on who the best players are, usually who is most proficient at the style known as GTO. But there is a very clear divergence across all fields who most would consider the best and those who actually win the most. And that's that divergence that we're gonna be exploring today. In my opinion, this comes down to the meta skills of poker, and that's what we're going to be exploring today. So there'll be two types of meta skills we're going to be talking about. First could be considered mental game. So strengthening your self-awareness, your mental toughness, your just plain old discipline, your ability to make good decisions under conditions of uncertainty. But also in um, a lot of the world, they would call these soft skills. So in poker, everyone knows that the game selection is incredibly important, but how do you get into good games? Um, the power of your reputation, 
both you know people getting out of your way, but also your ability to get paid off when you have a good hand. And then finally, just plain emotional intelligence. So this is both understanding how your emotions play a role in your own decision-making, but also recognizing when other people are getting a little bit emotional in their decision-making and making adjustments accordingly. So you know, today, I hope you'll walk away from this conversation with a little bit better of an idea of how to develop and apply these meta skills so that you can win more often. Uh, timeline for today, Garrett and I are gonna be talking in a fireside chat for about 40 minutes, and then we're gonna be opening it up for Q&A. Um, I encourage you, if anything we say sounds interesting, stands out, completely disagree, utilize the chat. Um, we're happy to get, keep that debate going there. Remember to turn it on all attendees. Uh, we're gonna be taking Q&A for the last 20 minutes via the Q&A function. You can see that at the bottom bar there. So anyone can submit a questions. And if you see a question that you're interested in hearing more about, make sure to upvote that because that's where the questions I'm gonna be choose, choosing, the questions that have been upvoted the most. Um, everyone's favorite question, we're gonna be going for 75 minutes today. So 1.15 Eastern. If you have to leave early, no worries. Um, we're going to be recording this and we'll be sending it out to you in a Monday email. Um, without further ado, um, you know, Garrett, thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, it's truly an honor and, you know, really, really excited to hear what you have to say today. Well, thank you for, for those very kind words, Chris. As you well know, you've been a mentor to me much more than the other way around, but, but I'll take the compliment nevertheless. Awesome. So let's jump in. So... I'm curious, what do you think, if you had to pick one, you know, what's that critical trait or mindset that you think helps separate someone in a competitive field like poker? Right. Yeah, I think I'll give you a very short answer first, uh, which uh, we'll, we'll come across as incredibly elementary and then we'll go from there. But I would say um, want and uh, working smart. So let me elaborate on both of those. Uh, you know, I remember the first time I read uh, an article by Mark Manson, I think it's called The Most Important Question in Your Life. Uh, and he discusses uh, how everybody wants to look good. Everybody wants to retire early. Everybody wants to be in a very healthy marriage, uh, but very few people truly want it, right? And to truly want any of those things, it requires the deep drive, desire, and want to put in great effort every single day. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no, there's no cheat code. There's no shortcut to life. There's no shortcut to, to any of, of one's macro or usually even micro goals in life. Um, you just got to put in the hard work every day. And, you know, I probably the book that connects the most with me regarding that is David Goggins' Can't Hurt Me. Uh, although he discusses it oftentimes as it relates to athletic feats, uh, he reminds me every day, you know, of, um, you know, how bad do I want it? Basically, you know, you were talking about what separates the 1% versus like a fraction of that. Uh, and, and Goggins refers to that as being uncommon amongst the uncommon, not the one in a hundred, but the one in 10,000. Uh, and, and, you know, so every day I, I wake up and, I challenge myself. In my mind, my identity is at risk every single morning when I wake up. And that's sort of discussed quite a bit in Atomic Habits, which is a very, uh, <laughs> that book obviously is insanely popular these days, but, but I do love that aspect of it. Um, you know, if I'm thinking about skipping a run, if I'm thinking about, you know, putting less work into my poker game or my relationship or whatever on any given day, I feel like my identity is at risk. Who do I want to be? Do I want to be a good runner or a truly elite runner? Do I want to be a good husband or, you know, the one in 10,000 husband who's willing to give everything for his wife? Um, so that's where the want comes. The second part is, is sort of just working smart. And, and I'll apply this one more specifically to poker. Poker is such an incredibly complex game and you know, if someone were to ask me, especially in 2020, how do I win money playing poker? The answer is just so complicated and so diverse. And, and I think many people don't really know where to get started. I can give you sort of like a basic example 
of how I don't think is like the best way to approach it, right? So a lot of what are generally considered the world's best poker players, uh, they're just studying sims or simulations like around the clock, right? Uh, and that makes them very technically proficient. Uh, but their ability to execute is is quite a bit different than that for one. But for two, even if one was the best at acquiring the knowledge as well as the execution thereafter, there's almost no like doubt in my mind uh, without a variety of other, as you call it, soft skills that they would earn even at a fraction of the rate uh, of those who have actually earned the most money in poker, you know? And so the concept of working smart, I think it applies to just so many different fields, but I mean, that it could never be more so, uh, more true than in poker, you know? And it's, it's complicated too, you know, because you can work smart in an unethical fashion potentially and, and earn a lot in poker in the short term, you know? But for me, it's like 98 out of 100 opportunities that come along just don't fit my criteria ethically, you know? So to be able to work super smart and, you know, be able to look at yourself in the mirror every night and feel really great about all the choices you make professionally, I think is, is a particularly challenging one in poker. So let's start there. Obviously, you know, you've been in the game for a long time and like you said, there are lots of short-term opportunities for profit, but if you're looking to stick around for the long term, both for, to maximize your bottom line, but also, like you said, the ability to you know sleep well, look at yourself in the mirror, and genuinely feel happy and fulfilled off the table requires playing this long game. Um, you know, we'd love to hear a little bit more in this context of of working smart things that you've done, which may be short term, you left some money on the table, but have long in the long run have led to perhaps more profit, but especially more happiness. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's several that come to the, the top of my head during COVID, you know, there's a whole bunch of poker capitalists and entrepreneurs that uh, have popped up or, or, or whatnot during uh, during this time and they're running, uh, you know, they're running illegal home games, they're running uh, more specifically illegal online games, right, where they're playing on play money sites, but, uh, you know, they're playing for real money. Uh, and, you know, there, I just think there's, there's several things ethically about that, that I don't feel great about, you know, and, and also, in many ways, it's just like a job I don't really want, you know, like, so you have to, you have to really prey on the losing players, you know, like uh, I try like in, in all interactions I have with all people, winning players, losing players, whatever to, um, to make sure that like, like the relationship comes first, you know, like, so uh, to me that always like just kind of comes naturally to me. So if someone's like a losing player, but like they're insufferable, like, I'm just not gonna, I'm just not gonna have a relationship with them, you know? Um, but, you know, quite often, like, you know, I'm good friends with a lot of world-class players and I'm good friends with a lot of losing players who, uh, despite not having like great technical proficiency at poker, they're great human beings and super interesting and, and whatever. So I think the point being is like, I just don't, I don't really want to have sort of that that card in my arsenal, you know, at, at this point in my life in terms of just looking at human beings as like pawns on a chessboard and how I can utilize them to my advantage. You know, I don't want to have to, you know, try to collect money from people, uh, you know, in these online games and, and you know, I don't want to, uh, I don't, I could just go on and on and on, but, but I think just the gist is like, there's just a whole bunch, I think, of gray areas in the poker economy in, in 2020. Um, you know, even like if we talk about like building live games, like there's just, there's just so many things that uh, you see most game builders do that I just don't feel comfortable with. And, and so as such, I just sit on the sidelines when it comes to that. 
Yeah, I, I think a commonality there around working smart is that you know clearly what's a yes for you and cl clearly what's a no. And you know, a lot of times that comes down to that ethical compass and where people get into these gray areas is they aren't clear on where they stand on these issues. And you know, thus things tend to you know, erode over time. What he, what he said was super interesting um, was that my identity is at risk. There is this notion in the startup world of keeping your identity small, that the more things you identify with, the more that you're, you know, you're, you become fragile. Um, it, but it seems like this in this, this instance of showing up and putting in the work every day, even when you don't want to, even when it sucks, has been a pretty key part of your success, right? I imagine a lot of poker, especially in the live arena, is just showing up because you don't know what's going to happen on that particular day. Um, let's say that the previous day, you know, you had a really tough session, you took a you took a big loss, or you know, you didn't play particularly well. Uh, what do you do to make sure that you keep that identity of someone who gets up and puts in the work intact? Right. Yeah, I, I love this question. Uh, you know, these are the days where. If my identity is at risk daily, I mean, it's a, it's exponentially more important the day after a big loss. I think one of the more interesting psychological components of playing uh, very high stakes poker is uh, sort of dealing with losses. You know, I'll, I'll play various days where I'll lose amounts of money that that are, are just truly mind boggling, uh, and you know. What I choose to do the next day, I think often sets the course for how the next several weeks, even months, you know, in my life can, can look, you know, in, in the past, I wasn't always excellent at this to say the least, you know, I could, I could go, you know, and hibernate for months after a huge loss, you know, I'd be like, whatever, I don't need to work. I don't need to play. And, and then I would just make a series of poor choices for months straight, you know, and fortunately, you know, with, with your coaching and, you know, a great psychologist and a bunch of other work over, over the last several years, you know, that, that almost never happens there, you know? So to answer your question more directly, um, what that looks like for me is just making sure I complete my morning ritual the following morning. You know, I think a more interesting question to me, isn't it, uh, how can I play well the next time I play, but how can I live a meaningful life the following day? Um, and, and that's sort of been the focus of my life the last half decade, not how can I earn more, but how can I live with peace um, to a greater extent each day? And so, you know, my morning ritual very briefly just includes, you know, waking up, coffee, clean meal, take the dogs running, meditate, you know, and then go from there. Um, and it's like, once I accomplish those, whatever it is, four things, like, I already just feel like just such a champion, you know, like that nothing, it doesn't matter like what comes at me the rest of the day. Like, I feel like I've already won and I've already sort of like sort of conquered this battle with myself and like have proven to myself that my identity is someone who uh, is very emotionally resilient. Someone who no matter what happens to me the day before, is gonna get up and do what he needs to do to be the best version of himself. Um, and so, you, you know, it's funny, all these sort of skills, like very coincidentally, I think sort of just translate to the poker table, you know, quite a bit um, because it's like, if I have another big game the next day, well, you know, I've completed my morning ritual. Like I'm just in a totally different headspace, you know, at that point and, and I'm ready to compete. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to execute. Yeah, I love that notion of emotional resilience and just living with peace. And hey, let's be clear, like your poker career, you know, whatever, whatever someone does for a living, that's subservient to just living a good life, right? We're not, we're not on this earth to make money. It's just one aspect of what allows us to, you know, support the people we love and do what we want to do. And I think a lot of people confuse that instrumental goal for a terminal goal. But what I find really fascinating is that I see time and time again that those who have, you know, let's say alignment off the table, they're living lives of peace, they take care of themselves, they avoid what I refer to as lifestyle leaks, you know, doing things off the table, you know, moral ambiguities, bad habits, et cetera. All those things show up in their play in really kind of nuanced ways. 
And I, I do think that's a true separator that it seems your life off the table um, is a reflection of your results on the table. Is that something that you've experienced? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more with that. I, I certainly, I can think of periods in my life where a lot of things um, were, were kind of in shambles and it without question affects my execution quite a bit, you know, and, you know, I'm very, very fortunate in, in so many ways in my life, but, you know, stability is a word that comes to mind, you know, first and foremost, um, balance, um, because I excel at these um I don't know, topics or, or whatnot to a much greater extent. Now, I think it, it allows me to, to, to perform at the, the highest level I can, you know, professionally as well. Talk to me about that preparation process. You know, you talked about the morning ritual a little bit. I mean, at this point, you've gotten pretty comfortable being in front of the cameras, but I imagine there's still a little bit of butterflies. You're sitting down with big stacks of cash from you, in front of you, playing against pretty tough players in front of the cameras. What's that mental and physical preparation process look like? Right. Yeah. You know, it, interestingly, that it, it's like this: the cameras just become second nature, like when you're on them for a while. But I can certainly relate initially when when I started playing on streams. Like it's it's very nerve wracking. Like what it really makes you do is you just freeze up. Like you just don't want to bluff nearly as often as you should, <laughs> you know, like uh, you just like want to, you just don't want to make a mistake, you know, um, basically. And, and I think that's like what leads to, um, to a lot of people sort of under bluffing or whatnot initially, but you know, I, I'll steal from LeBron here when it comes to, to preparation, he says the same thing over and over, but he always says, you know what, I, I put in the work and I'll live with the results. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, although every athlete has said something more or less the same, you know, for, over the course of time, I, I just love that so much. And I think that that's a real differentiator between myself and a lot of people at the table. I'm willing to make tragic errors. I'm willing to be just terribly wrong. I'm willing to do something that uh, a poker computer simulation would never advocate doing based on exploiting a player's specific tendencies, right? Or my perception of their specific tendencies, which could be wrong, right? But the point is, is I put in so much work and so much blood, sweat, and tears into poker, not just from an effort standpoint, but but like I said, uh, you know, working smart that. I'm willing to just get out there and, and do sort of, you know, what I need to do. So, so that's where the, the preparation uh, sort of comes from, you know, on the day of a, a big game, whether it's a stream or, or not, I don't really do anything different. That's, that's, you know, the interesting thing because my morning ritual is just so rock solid that, you know, um, you, you know, kind of is what it is, but I would say I'll generally have a, a brief conversation with myself, you know, as I drive to the casino where, um, you know, a, a little pep talk, if you will, you know, there's, there's so many things that we're talking about here, Chris, that like, I know that I'm very fortunate to either genetically or environmentally been blessed with like a variety of skills. And so one of those skills is, is just great self-belief you know, and I mean, a lot of that comes from childhood. And so I'm so fortunate that, that I was given that, but, you know, so, so on that drive to the casino, you know, there will, there will certainly be some positive self-talk, you know, they'll just say, I'll say, you know, like you have outworked everyone you're going to play against today. Like you live to execute better than anyone when like pressure's at its highest. It doesn't even matter if it's true. Like in, like in, like if someone could somehow objectively measure that, right? It doesn't matter like whether that's true. I deeply, deeply believe it. And because I believe it, I'm convinced that that has like a, a very positive impact, you know, on, on my results. And, you know, especially in poker, not to get like too deep into it, but, you know, if you're playing a, a game that's much bigger than usual and, you know, you're, you get into a hand and, uh, you know, I find it to be correct to, to bluff off a quarter million dollars in this hand or something, right? A lot of people just can't, they don't have that button. They can't, they can't do it. it it's just, it's just too scary. But, and I think the only way one can really just like, you know, 
muster up the courage to do that, it, I think just comes from like a deep belief that what they're doing is correct. And then if and when, because definitely it goes wrong plenty of the time, you're able to forgive yourself and and move on and 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 make peace with it. I think that's what a lot of people live their life, I think, in fear, even at the poker table. Like you would think high stakes poker players would be some of the most fearless people alive. Mm-hmm. And maybe they are compared to the general population. But like there are wide, wide uh, ranges in terms of uh, the, the level of fear people play with, um, you know, when they're playing the biggest games and, you know, the, the amount of money you can win or lose on this day is 10 times greater than what you're typically used to. Gary, there's, there's so much wisdom there. Um, so I think there's, there's really a lot that up and coming players can take away from that. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to underline that I find particularly interesting. The, the, the way that it really hit home for me, this notion of self-belief is that you have this continuum and on one end of the continuum, you have, let's say, full confidence. Like I am 100% confident that I am the best player at this table and like everything mm-hmm. that I do is perfect. And yeah. you have, okay, after the session, after the cameras are off, you go over those hands and be like, let's assume that I played every single hand badly. Uh, how did I play that hand badly? How could I have played it better? This is like full inquiry. And that the wisdom is that both thinking hats can be incredibly beneficial, but you have to know when to wear which hat. When you're sitting down at the table against other players, it's not the time to question, hey, am I actually a winning player? Do I deserve to be here? That there's, there's a time and a place to question everything. You have to know when that place is. And there's a lot of there's a lot of wisdom in being able to separate those, those two mindsets. And I just love what you said, because I, I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate that the game gets exponentially harder every year. So I, I refer to this as the red queen effect, which comes from Alice in Wonderland, is that you have to run as fast as you can just to remain in the same place. It's like, if you're not growing, you're falling behind, you're going to go extinct. And so you need to find ways to keep the game interesting and to keep exploring things. And if you start to just fall into what I find is a trap of, I found a way to play that works and I'm just gonna keep doing that over and over again, you, you, you start, you stop growing. Um, you weaken as a player and you get passed by. And it comes from this willingness to look like a complete idiot by doing something that's just completely unconventional and possibly wrong but it's through that it's through that exploration and discovery that you stumble upon things that are new and work and actually can be a differentiator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, you know, I I couldn't agree more with what you just said, and I'm glad you highlighted it. Uh, there's there's an endless sea uh, of poker players who have that sort of confidence that they just described that I just described irrationally uh, and all of the time. Right. Uh, and, and you you described it perfectly, where when you're at the table, self-belief is everything. The moment you leave the table, you have to. And it, it's not it's not like part of our makeup to be both of these things to at that point be very, very humble and very self-aware and be able to take a deep dive in terms of like what you did correctly and what you did incorrectly. Uh, you, you just you rarely see a poker player who's exceptional at both skills, you know, because it's, it's just not the way uh, our brains are wired. Um, and so I couldn't agree more in terms of, you know, how important that is. Although when I'm playing, my belief is, you know, sky high, you know, I always have a, a scale that I run with my fiance after a session, you know, just a, a one to 10. How well did I play? How well did I run? Just to give her a feel for, for how it went, you know? Um, and I mean, it is very rare I give myself a, a number higher than seven in terms of how well I play, you know? And so it, you have to figure out a way to do both. And I really think that concept too can apply to all of your listeners who don't play poker as well. I think when, you're, when you have sort of big moments in your professional life or, or any part of your life, you know, maybe something big in your personal life or whatnot too, uh, I think it's critical that, you know, you you deeply believe in yourself in that moment 
And then after, when it's time for reflection, uh, you have the self-awareness to go back to the drawing board and, and figure out how to be better next time. Yeah, what I'm hearing is that really the, the critical skill is self-awareness here and that what you draw your attention to, right? And so we see what we're looking for. If you want to create that narrative of, oh, I ran so bad and, you know, those players are awful and, you know, next time, you know, things are going to yeah. be different, um, you're, you'll yeah. easily find examples of that. And if you're looking for examples of, hey, I might have played this hand a little bit differently and it might have gone better, you'll clearly find examples of that as well. And so there's a lot of power in just the simple one to 10 scale. I always tell clients, like, if you can put a number on something, then you can identify things that will take that number up or down, that'll change your conviction level. And so yes. if you say, hey, I played a seven out of 10, then the follow-up question is, well, is there, what could I have done to get myself to an eight? And that yes. by starting to ask yourself these questions, you get yourself out of the trap of, oh, I did everything I could and I just got unlucky. There's always a way to improve. And that's the key is you're always looking for ways to improve. And it's not a challenge to yourself. It's like, oh, it's not, I'm not bad, but just like, I always want to improve. And that, that's, that's that key part of the identity that you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. I think Tom Brady says like, yeah, I still haven't played a perfect game, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying like every single time. And again, I think that applies like really well to life. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been an interesting ride for me. A lot of people always ask me like, how, how did you sort of acquire these, this mindset or, or these, uh, these sort of thought processes. Right. And I mean, really it came from just having like great financial success at a young age and still being terribly unhappy. You know, like <laughs> not many people are blessed with, with both of those things happening to them, you know? And, and so the, you know, getting to that point, uh, it's like, you know, I mean, obviously you see plenty of people who are miserable their whole life, you know, but I think quite a lot of people, if they can do both of those things, acquire a, a lot of wealth and be very unhappy, usually they're, they're going to then sort of um, follow on a path for, okay, well, how do I, how do I smile more, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and so to me, it's not, it's not just about, you know, trying to play the perfect game every time I sit down at the table, but try to be better at everything that matters to me every single day. Uh, and for me, that's, that's been sort of a big component of, of why I wake up each day, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, cause for a while I didn't, I didn't really know the answer to that. Why would I wake up tomorrow? You know, and that's sort of related to, to some depression sort of issues too that I used to struggle with quite a bit. And I just, I just never struggle with that question anymore, you know, because I have so many answers, but one of them is very much, I want to be better today. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better brother. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better runner and on and on and on. Yeah, I, I like to tell uh, entrepreneurs in particular is that their biggest bottleneck is having a good reason to get out of the bed in the morning because it yeah. does it does create an issue where hey I don't need to do anything I'm my own boss I have enough um, you know I can live on that beach in Thailand and you know just be be just fine and needing to continually find those reasons to keep growing and to get out of bed and to put in the work and a lot of it comes down to that mindset. Um, you know, a couple of those names that you mentioned, like LeBron James, Tom Brady, I think a lot of people would recognize, hey, these are players who, as the game goes on, they get stronger, where they're, they start to distance themselves from the pack in the fourth quarter. I don't think a lot of people realize these televised streams, maybe you're filming for four or five hours, but a lot of people think, hey, the cameras turn off and everyone just packs up and goes home. But a lot of times these games go on for 12, 16, 24 hours. And I imagine that you see yourself as this fourth quarter type of player. Um, what do you think helps you to separate yourself from the pack in these really long sessions? Yeah, another, another good question. Definitely a, a key component, I think, of, of um, earning at the highest level in the biggest games is, you know, unlike sort of the typical 510 game that kind of goes around the clock and thus, you know, a lot of times your hourly isn't changing too much. Um, you know, in the biggest high stakes games, you know, my hourly can just be just some exponentially higher number on hour 18 or even hour 44, um, you know, versus the first few hours of the game. And uh, you know, I, again, just kind of want to go back to, to how bad do you want it? 
you know, uh, there's actually a book about running that's called How Bad Do You Want It uh, that, that I love too. And, and the point is badly, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm just like, I can't even see straight, everyone's tired. Like that's, there's something inside of me that I've always had and I'm very fortunate that I have it. Like that's where I go like into like, just like a bit of psycho, like mortal combat, like finish him type mode, you know, where like no one else can even keep their eyes open. Like we're on our like 44, you know, like, and, and it's like weird because the human brain will mess with you at this point. Right. Where like, you won't think it matters as much as it mattered to you on hour one or hour six, you know, um, but building like the mental strength to know, no, not only is it as important, it's that much more important, right? You have an opportunity to capitalize here because people are playing poorly or the game has gotten bigger or often both um, that, uh, you know, like I I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would say something like from hours 12 plus in my poker career, right? So from the 12th hour all the way on to whenever the, the session ends, I would have to think that like well over half of my profits, you know, have have come from those times. And it could be something like egregious, like 75%, which is, which is probably mind boggling to a lot of poker players here. They're like, I never even get to hour 13. Like how have almost all of the money, you know? Uh, And, and so I think that that's always just been, it's just something that that's been deep inside me. Even when I had like a lot of mental health struggles and stuff like that, um, I think from a very young age, I just had this incredible fear of being ordinary. Uh, And, you know, I've tried to channel that back a bit in recent years uh, to live with a bit more peace. Uh, But I think for most people, I think challenging themselves to be extraordinary, to be uncommon amongst the uncommon is, is generally, uh, generally the path, you know, you want to take. I just, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I, I just like, I see 99 people in a room and I just say, I don't want to be anything like you, <laughs> you know, like I want to do something totally different, you know? Uh, and you know, yeah. So. Man, I love that. I have, to, I have to pull on that thread. Uh, so you, I imagine you can start to see, like, I think uh, the studies show, Hey, after even hour three, our decision-making rapidly deteriorates. And sure. you know, I think something that's important to emphasize, if, you know, particularly in poker, but in a lot of competitive fields, say, you know, investing, business, et cetera, it's not absolute skill, it's relative skill, where it doesn't matter how good you are on an absolute level, it's how good are you on a relative level, is you can either be the best player in the world and play against the toughest players and where, hey, it's very possible if you're in the toughest game of the world, you could be the sixth best best, best player in the world and be a losing player because relatively you're not the best. Um, on the other hand, I like to say, hey, you can be a little leaguer playing in a t-ball league in your MVP every year that, hey, it's this relative skill. And so as you see people start to deteriorate as session goes on hour 10, hour 16, it doesn't matter as much that you are getting worse. It's that you're not getting worse as quickly as everyone else is. So on a relative level, that gap is widening. And so I just have to ask, what do you start to see from other players where you can tell that they're starting to fade. And I imagine it, as you start to like lick your chops a little bit is like, all right, I know that I'm not playing my best, but I can know these guys are definitely not playing their best. Are there any signs that you start to see? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, and you know, to your point, I just wanna quickly elaborate. I mean, it, it's just so spot on. Like you have a lot of the best players in the world and they just play excellent four hour sessions and then they quit and then they wake up and do the same thing the next day. It's just. It is just so incredibly counterproductive if your goal is to make as much money as you can. You know, if the goal is like to be the best for four hours, then yeah, then you win, you know, go ahead. Yeah, you would think, uh, so they looked at uh, cab drivers. And so what cab drivers do 
is they drive until they hit their quota for the day. Let's say, you know, they, they, they want to make $100 a day. And so what happens a lot of times is some days maybe it's rainy or there's tons of traffic. It might take them 10 or 12 hours to hit those, those, those 100 bucks. So they keep going until they hit the 100 bucks. And then some days, you know, maybe it's New Year's Eve or something. They do two, two long distance fares and they hit 100 bucks and then they quit. And it's the idea that your hourly is so variable. And a lot of times people sacrifice profit for the sake of convenience because they want to be able to play when most convenient to them. They want to be able to play short sessions. And then if you really, really want to win, it's like you said, what are you willing to give up? What's the, what price are you willing to pay? How hard are you willing to go? And, you know, a lot of people out there, hey, they're very, very good, but they're quitting when they hit their hundred dollars when there's lots more money on the table. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's super interesting to me, you know, uh, just cause it's just so different than, than the way I'm wired, but, but yet I have an awareness that that, you know, that makes up at least nine out of 10 people, you know, but to, to answer your question specifically, the, the first thing you often see is autopilot, uh, at the poker table where people in a variety of spots are, are playing very balanced mixed strategies in a variety of spots. Uh, but like on hour 17 or whatever, they just don't have like the bandwidth to be able to execute these complex mixed strategies, like in a variety, wide variety of spots. The other one you see um, related to, to autopilot is like between hands, like they're zoning out, like they're sitting on their phone, you know, whatever the case, like, I mean, honestly, all that shit just makes me like so hungry, you know, like I'm like... <laughs> this guy's sitting here like on Tinder swiping or whatever, like, and I, I couldn't be more locked in, you know, like it doesn't matter that like my net worth might be a hundred X this guy. Like I want it so much more than him every fucking day, including today, you know? Um, and, and so there, there's all sorts of sort of little things like that. Um, but, but you know, those are a couple, at least specifically at the poker table. I think this is a good question to uh, you know, put in the uh, question from uh, Anish. So, you know, obviously being in the spotlight, playing on TV, there's lots of haters out there, lots of armchair quarterback players who say, oh, like, you know, Garrett doesn't play all that great, right? Everyone who thinks they're entitled to an opinion. And you've been pretty public that, hey, I don't care what anyone thinks. And even it's like, it's probably for the best if people don't think that I'm good. And so, hey, go ahead, hate away. Um, you know, what, what have you done? I know like ego is so, so costly, especially, you know, when we're in our younger years, we care so much about what other people think. A lot of times I see people care more about what other people think than actually making money. Uh, there was a site back in the day, Poker Table Ratings, and people would post publicly, oh, I've, way, I've made way more than the site says. Like, is that really what you want? <laughs> Do you really right. care that much? Um, like, what have you done to, you know, limit the force of your ego and just care less what other people think? Um, I think it ties into what you're saying before about being comfortable about being incredibly wrong. Right. Yeah. You know, th these are really tough skills. And again, it, this stuff, you know, I've, I was not particularly strong in, you know, in my twenties, but uh, I think honestly, if, I mean, I'm going to get corny here for a minute, but I think it comes down first and foremost, the self-love, you know, uh, I think a lot of ego or at least, uh, outward sort of bravado comes from a, a place of insecurity. And there wasn't a time where I had a lot of self-love and now I do, you know, now, now I like myself. Uh, and, and I'm sort of at peace with like who I am and where I'm strong and, and where I'm weak. And it, it just like, it, it just makes it a lot easier. You know, I think, I think the question is, is a bit challenging because there's probably, you know, a lot of people watching they go, well, yeah, if I, if I were you, if I had your life, your this, that, like, I too wouldn't be so insecure. I too wouldn't be like trying to tell anyone who would listen, Hey, look, I'm good at poker you know? So, you know, it is, it is a bit tough to answer. Certainly you're right. Like, uh, advertising yourself as like a good player is like not an intelligent strategy in the live poker arena. Um, you know, uh, hmm, I, I guess, I guess I'll kind of leave that there. I, I, I don't think I have a great, uh, a great answer for that one. Sorry. 
Well, I think let, let's let's go into the self love. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned mm-hmm. that you know this has been an area of growth for you, and maybe maybe in the past, maybe earlier in this in your career, um, this wasn't the case, right? Where you were the the successful but not happy. Um, is there anything that's worked for you in you know developing that this self love? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that would kind of just dive into like you know mental health stuff, but certainly my psychologist like was very important. My work with you on, you know, productivity and and your coaching and mentorship, you know, played a big role. Meditation played a big role in that. Um, Let's see. uh, What else? Did I say cognitive behavioral therapy? Cognitive behavioral therapy as a specific subset of psychotherapy uh, has has been sort of absolutely critical, you know, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reference one thing that you taught me because everyone I tell it to is just blown away and they just love it so much. Uh, And it goes back to what you were talking about in terms of quantifying things. Uh, Of course, that's just the way our brains work and many poker players work to quantify things. Uh, But when I quantified something as incredibly uh, like abstract uh, as uh, like, what was the quality of my day or like, what, how would I rank my productivity, let's say, is a bit more objective of a question on a scale of one to 10. And what you helped me to realize was I was having two types of days, zero and 10, right? And like Mm -hmm. three out of 10 days were like 10 out of 10. And yeah, my 10 out of 10 days are very impressive and not many people can touch them. But my average score was three out of 10. Like that is, that is a very inefficient life, you know? Uh, And so, you know, our work really helped me a lot to raise that slowly but surely to, I mean, now I'm probably at like an eight and a, eight and a half or whatever average out of 10, you know, but that's because I'm not trying to get to 10 out of 10 every day. I'm happy with the sevens. I'm happy with the eights. And I just really want to make sure I get to a five each day. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that raising the floor on our our happiness on the decisions we make is usually the highest leverage where everyone wants to hit that 10 out of 10 every day but that's what leads to burnout and regression of the mean and the perfectionism that you know prevents this long-term consistency that leads to the long-term results Uh, i mean it seems like this self-awareness has been really huge for you um you know let's say that you're at the table and you witness yourself making a bad decision. Maybe, maybe you feel you're on the, the verge of tilting. Um, t- take us through that, that self-talk or that, that moment where you try to you know, reset yourself and get yourself back on track. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's a few questions I ask myself in this spot. I say, uh, okay, here's where we're at. Here's the status of, of your life in this moment. You, you made an error, it cost you X thousand dollars, right? I have two choices now. I can forgive myself and execute to the best of my ability on this next hand, or I can punish myself um, and play this next hand poorly too, right? And then I think about how I'll feel tomorrow if I go with option two. Uh, And I recognize that there was a time in my life where I had many self-destructive tendencies, many, and this was this was just like a, a, a manifestation of one of them, you know? Uh, and so now I just make the choice. I choose not to cause myself further harm, further pain. Um, another thing I would say is, is just gratitude. You know, it's like I use gratitude all day, every day, wherever I'm at. But uh, when I'm not running well or getting unlucky in poker, but more specifically not playing well, the first thing I think about is it doesn't matter. Like I'm fine. You know, like I'm so grateful for my life that I'm not even concerned that I just lost like, again, however many thousand in that hand, you know, that like, and although when I get home, I will be very upset. Right. Because I'm very hard at my, on myself in post session review to again, because I'm always striving to to play that perfect game that I'll never actually play. In that moment, I know the the self-hatred will not serve me in any way, you know? So I just, 
I just think about all of the good in my life and, and how fortunate I am and all, all the things I'm so grateful for. And, you know, very few of those are, are related to sort of financial success anyway. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. I, I think that this meta skill of how can you have empathy with your future self is, is one that we, we try to build throughout our lives because so many times, you know, poker table and in life, our short-term desires become divorced from our long-term goals. And we do things which are counterproductive or even self-sabotaging because we, we, we lose track of what we're here to accomplish. Um, and so just reminding yourself, I love this question of how will I feel about this tomorrow? Let's make a decision now that I'll feel good about when I look back on this because every decision we make echoes into eternity. It's like, there's no harm really, like the results of any given session or day don't really matter. And it's like, hey, if we tilt, we, we tilt off of another buy-in, like it does not really matter all that much. What's really harmful is that every time we tilt, we make it more likely we're gonna tilt in that situation in the future. We've, we've rewarded, we've reinforced taking that action. And so the more we can say, all right, I am going to make choices now in the moment that I'm gonna feel good about in the future that creates a little bit more separation, which is generally all we need, that kind of gap between stimulus and response. And so what I'm hearing from you is just creating a little bit of space for intentionality. It's like slowing down your breath, taking a moment to say, all right, I feel myself racing. I feel these emotions coming up. Uh, let's take a step back from that for a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The breath, again, that's key, you know? Part of like me taking some breaths is like, I'm just grateful to even be alive. I know it's so corny, <laughs> but like, that's like one of the first things, like when I take some breaths, like to just try and chill out, you know? Uh, but yeah, I mean, it really does, you know, calm me down a lot. You know, you mentioned uh, a few things there that are touched on in Atomic Habits too, where good habits uh you know, are reinforced and over time you get better and better at them, but so are bad habits, you know? Uh, and, you know, if you're like a 19 year old poker player listening to what I'm saying, like I, I think to be able to implement this consistently and successfully is gonna be very challenging. Uh, I think you just have to learn a lot of this through experience, you know, whether it's like tilting off buy-in after buy-in or like, you know, having seven too many shots or, and, and everything in between. For me, it's like, I really had to learn the hard way uh, by making a lot of really bad choices over and over and over again, that, hey, uh, this isn't worth it, you know? Like, I want to like myself as much as I can tomorrow. And so I wanna make choices today that, that give me the best opportunity to do that, you know? And, you know, for a lot of people, maybe that's not that hard, but for me, it took, you know, it took 30 years to, to start to do that with, with a decent level of success. I, I agree. I, I think it's very difficult to really internalize these things without that personal experience. And I think it seems like the primary lever we have is how many times do we have to pay tuition for the same lesson? Is mm -hmm. like, we're, we're, it's gonna happen, but like how many times does it need to happen before we start to change um, how we react to it? And, and what I hear that I, I love, which I think is worth emphasizing, is how much you emphasize changing that narrative. I think that we, it's very, very easy to fall into these narratives where we become the victim, where things are happening to us rather than the other way around. And what I love is that you recognize there's so much that's outside of your control. Thus you have a one to 10 for play and a one to 10 for how you ran and you don't conflate those two. But even though so much of the luck in life is out of your control, what is in control is your response to that. And so you, that's the narrative that you take, you take to heart is, hey, these things happen, but this is what I did because of that. I think that that's really powerful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like uh, th the whole victim mentality is like such a turnoff for me. It's, it's been hard for me to even maintain like close relationships with, with people who, who feel that way, you know, because I've, I've always just felt like, first of all, I'm fine just accepting that I've gotten lucky or ran hotter than anyone else on earth. I just wake up every morning saying that, I don't know if it's true. It doesn't really matter. You know, like 
whatever it is, it's totally out of my control. But what is in my control is I can make a series of choices today that like I can feel good about, you know? And I mean, I think it'd be naive to think that sort of um, the peace I live with is just completely uncorrelated with with that great effort I put in every day. You know, it, 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 it almost certainly has something to do with it. And t- like in terms of the percentage of it, I just don't care, honestly. That's I'm I'm happy to like play the quantitative guessing game on so many things, but that one is just it, it just doesn't interest me. Like because I don't want to do anything that puts me at risk of going back to that place where I'm unable to consistently um, have meaningful and fulfilling days. You know, that's that's really just everything in my life is about that. Like if I can't do that there's no way I can be a good husband or friend or, or anything else, you know? And so I'm never going to, I'm never going to tell myself any story that, that stops me from sort of pushing forward, you know, uh, however true it may be. Garrett, man, I, I love this so much. Uh, you know, I could go on about this for, for hours. Um, yeah. Thank you so much as always for, for sharing. I want to, I want to hand things off to Q and a, because we have a lot of really good questions that I want to give an opportunity to, to answer. So, you know, feel free to, you know, evolve these questions to your own liking as far as what you'd like to answer. Sure. Um, so, so first question, uh, I'm going to paraphrase this as how do you, how do you become someone who others like playing with? Um, you know, it's like, you you'd see the opposite of this, like someone, you know, wearing the noise canceling headphones, not, not talking, not acknowledging, you know, every, every hand is like the final table, the world series of poker. Like, how do you become someone who others want to play with? Right. Yeah. So um, the first thing I want to say about this is, I feel like a lot of poker players specifically answer this question as though it can be solved like a Pio sim. Um, and it's just like, that's just not how it works. And I'm empathetic to the fact that um, many poker players who are exceptional at the, the technical aspects of the game, and that's what allows them to do well, they struggle socially or on an emotional intelligence level that that they, or an, on an autism scale even, that they even have to ask a question like this. It, you know, I, I understand that, but I don't, it's not, I don't think it's something that you study, or at least it's not something I would know how to study, you know? Like for me, uh, it came from honestly, just like a lot of work on myself. Uh, how can I become someone who's more interested in other human beings? I think that's really the question. Um, and if you are, and you have to do it for the right reasons. If you go, okay, I'm going to teach myself how to be interested in others because then I'm going to make some more money. Uh, I don't think that's going to work. And also, that like makes me sick to my stomach even thinking about someone going about it in that way, you know. Uh, and and so I think I just spent a lot of time in my life on personal development in terms of how can I be a better version of myself? How can I treat others better? Uh, and, you know, to take another thing I learned from you, uh, how can I dig to find uh, what this person is an expert witness at, you know, but it's not going to happen if you're not genuinely interested in them. Yeah, I, I love that. The, the notion that this is just another game to be solved is a, is a total yeah. trap. And, you know, obviously it will likely have the opposite effect of what's mm-hmm. intended. And I think that that might be my favorite piece of advice from the classic, you know, Dale Carnegie is don't try to be someone who's interesting, just be interested in other people. And again, it's not really something that you can or should want to fake. You you have to actually be looking for, hey, someone, everyone has something to teach me. Everyone is an expert in something and be curious is that that's the, the process of discovery is what is this person's superpower that they might not even know is a superpower. Um, another piece of advice that I got early on that served me really well. Um, you know, there's the whole like pickup scene, which is you know saying the right line, and you know what what are the, what are the routines that you run through to get someone to fall in love with you? And you can see, you know, again, like to take someone's advice, it's like, do I really want this person's life? That's always a good criteria. And I thought what a much better approach to dating was rather than how do I get someone 
to love me. It's how do I become someone who others love? And mm -hmm. it's like becoming the person who the person that you want to date wants to date. And a lot of that is just coming back to working on yourself, um, that there's no, there's no game to it. That is the game. Oh yeah. I love that. I mean, I read that, that book, the game and, uh, you know, have talked with like some peers, you know, who got into PUA pickup artistry and like the whole thing always just <laughs> freaked me out, honestly, but you know, I, I love what you said and, and I want to correlate it to what I think our, our biggest goal in life is, is, uh, to find and spend our life with, you know, one person successfully. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, it's like, if I can do that well, like, I feel like, you know, my floor is like an eight out of 10, you know, uh, and, and that's, that's really a big part of, you know, how I think I've been fortunate enough to, uh, you know, to find my future wife, we're engaged is, I think I put in the hard work to be a better person. I used to say this thing to my friends. Uh, I used to say, I don't want to date a girl like me. I want to date a girl who's way better than me. Right. I want to like, uh, I want to marry up if you will. Uh, I don't really buy that working like as a long-term like marriage. I, I feel like, it, you know, you're going to run into like a lot of trouble. Uh, oftentimes like she's going to realize she's too good for you and the marriage is going to fall apart. You know, the only way I was going to be able to truly marry a spectacular person as my fiance is, is to become a spectacular person myself, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I don't mm -hmm. know if I am or not or whatever, but I do know that that is very much uh, the goal and the focus and you can't trick someone into to thinking that. And, uh, and it's like, if, if you're thinking like, man, if, if this person only really knew me, you know, you're, you're probably on the wrong track. <laughs> I, I love this question from Mohammed because there's this, this notion in poker, investing in business, the, of like the, the sole hero, someone who overcame all the odds on their own and is now standing on the top. And it seems to me that it's, that's just such a misnomer is that great players, great people come up together. Um, you know, how have the people around you, you know, their, how their mindsets and their ways of looking at the world rubbed off on you that's allowed you to become the person you are now? Yeah, I, I think I have uh, a few different like close friends and family members and I've taken a little bit from each of them, you know, like, but I didn't have like a crew like many elite poker players do where they studied together forever. I've I never had that. I always just worked on my own, um, which is very likely not the best way to go about it. Um, but, you know, like I've taken so much from my sister in terms of just how to be like just a really high quality human being. You know, I've taken a lot from one of my best friends on like how to just like live like a productive life each day and just like specifically to show up each day, you know. And so, you know, a little bit of that. And, and I have all sorts of role models, uh, you know, that from books, but but, you know, that's that's kind of it. You know, I've discussed this in another podcast, but the concept of anti role models has just been so big for me. There's a couple people who I'm very close with in my life. Uh, or, or I think, you know, your listeners are getting the gist and in so many ways, I wanted to make sure that my life was nearly the opposite of theirs. Uh, and so I used their choices as fuel to make sure I never, I never became them or like them or, or anything like that, you know? And I think that's sort of related to, to go full circle with, with the identity sort of thing we discussed earlier. You know, I need to challenge myself, not only like, am I the kind of person who does A and B and C, but also if not, then I'm this person who does, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, and so I kind of blend that all together to, to just stay very hungry. Oh, I feel like I need to ask about that. There is a question here. So, you know, it's easy when you're in uh, this, this one comes from DJ. So, you know, it's easy when you're moving up the ranks and hey, there's another limit to reach um, to stay hungry. But when you've when you've, you're playing the biggest games that you can play and you've somewhat reached the top, they said like that that's that that's a challenge right how do you how do you avoid plateauing becoming satisfied becoming complacent um 
you know, what, what is your key to, to staying hungry and continuing to grow? Yeah, you definitely need a why. And oftentimes you need several whys. And it's, in my case, a, a very challenging one. You know, the, the first thing that, that has come to mind in recent years, every time I ask my that, myself that is, is, is just the concept of giving. You know, and so giving, I feel like loosely kind of goes to giving to people, you know, friends, family uh, versus giving time, money, et cetera, to sort of philanthropic organizations. I find those two concepts to be very different. Uh, and, and I would suggest, uh, you know, your listeners to experiment with both because they may connect quite a bit more with one than the other. Um, so, I mean, you know, to a very large extent, I earn to give, you know, whether it's give to friends and family, give to philanthropy, uh, you know, that I care about these days, or even just give to my future children, grandchildren, et cetera. You know, it's, it's not about me. Uh, and, you know, there's this deep awareness that like, I have no use for money as it relates to like increasing the utility of my life at this point, you know? And so if, if I'm just trying to earn for earning sake and not understanding why it's, it's not going to work, you know? Uh, the other thing that, it, you know, that I would say is like, I like to gamify everything, you know, in the end, poker itself is a game and earning money is a game. And let's face it, we live in America, like <laughs> everyone's trying really fucking hard at this let's make money game, right? I mean, it doesn't even matter who you are, like almost everyone's trying pretty hard at that one. To me, there's a satisfaction in going, I'm not even playing for that. I'm just playing to beat you. <laughs> you know, like I'm just such a competitor uh, that like, if you want to play me in a game, like let's go, let's battle, you know? Cause like, it's like, we're here on earth. Like, you know, for what reason, you know uh, for me, a part of it's like, you know, let's, let's battle. I think that's such a, a fun frame because uh, once something becomes a game, it becomes a little bit playful. It takes away all of the yeah. pressure, the, the life or death. It's, hey, let's explore what can happen within these rules, which we've all agreed to play by. And a lot of people forget that they have agreed to play, that this finite game has become an infinite game for them. But at the beginning, like you've, you've agreed to play to this game. And I think that a lot of people forget that and they lose sight of, hey, like you can, you can stop playing the capitalism game anytime, no one's forcing you. Mm -hmm. And so if you're gonna yeah. play, you might as well play well and you might as well enjoy it. That's right, yeah, that's what I mean, you know, like these days, like poker is a, you know, a, definitely a part-time role in my life. So, you know, most of the, most of the games I'm playing in my life these days are, are completely unrelated to capitalism. But when I'm showing up to play that game, like, yeah, let's do it. Like I know, <laughs> like, especially in poker, man, there are so many incredibly like super thirsty guys where like the only thing that matters to them is trying to earn money. Like they have like not much purpose or, or goals beyond that. I mean, it, it's obviously very satisfying to, to, you know, to outwork and outplay someone uh, like with that sort of mindset. Cause I'm like, you're not contributing to society anyway. You know, like the only thing you're doing with your life is trying to win the zero sum game. And so like, I couldn't feel better at beating you at it and then like doing my part to like make the world a better place in whatever very small way, you know? Yeah, it reminds me of the concept of Wu Wei, which is the art of not trying. That oftentimes the tryhards, the harder that you, the harder that you try, the worse the results that uh, right. you, know, you get in your own way. Uh, I think this is a great one to to end on. And, and again, thank you so much, Garrett. This is this is such a pleasure. Um, this one comes from Goner, from uh, Connor. Sorry. Um, poker parallels life so much. Um, if you had to pick one, what's a big life lesson that you've taken away from your years in the game of poker? Mm, good one. Tough one. Let me think about it just for a second. Um, okay. I think I'll just, I'll just use this one. So you know, I'm planning my wedding right now and I'm, I'm not a religious person in any way, but, uh, you know, I was having a chat with my dad last night and he was talking to me about, will you, will you go ahead and, uh, break the glass when you get married? Right. That's a tradition in Jewish weddings. Right. 
And it very loosely like translates to in life, in marriage, things are gonna get fucked up. Things are going to break, you know? So let's just get this out of the way now. Let's, let's sort of face our first adversity right now and let's break this glass. Uh, I think both in life and poker and marriage, uh, I think an acceptance that life is very messy, that humans are very messy and that shit is gonna break all the time. And that it's not about trying to prevent the breaks. It's about picking up the pieces thereafter. Uh, in essence, it's about how are you going to handle adversity, you know? And, and so, you know, where I've made a lot of strides in my life is recognizing that when bad things happen, even really bad things happen, the mechanism that I have sort of impulsively now like kicks in sort of uh, related to, to how serious the issue or tragedy is. So I know like the worse an issue is, like something snaps in me where I go, okay, like I need to handle this, you know, with great care, with great effort uh, and, and just give it, you know, everything I've got to be able to, to sort of overcome and, and move forward. And I mean, in poker, it's like, you know, you're winning or you're losing like almost half the hands you play, you know, and so, if you're not able to deal with the adversity, whether it's calling a small river bet, you know, that's like very small and you should be able to forgive yourself easier or, you know, running that half million dollar bluff that goes wrong. And like, it was so tragic that now maybe you have to play like smaller stakes, being able to handle that adversity. I think, I just think you can do anything in life if you can do that. And if, if you're not good at that, as I wasn't in my twenties, like, your ceiling is so low. Yeah, that, that seems like the ultimate meta skill is your ability to deal with adversity in an uncertain world where things are guaranteed to break. And it goes back to what you're saying about a lot of players and a lot of people living out of fear that things are going to break when they will. And understanding and anticipating that allows you to react and thrive into those situations that the world being a bit fragile can actually be a personal advantage if you're prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Your, your concept of anti-fragile that you've taught me is, is critical in my life for sure. Garrett, thank you so much. Um, I said, this is, this is truly an honor. Love this conversation. I think you had a lot of wisdom for up and coming players and just people who want to live lives of peace. Um, anything else you'd like to share with uh, those who are listening anywhere you'd want to direct people? Uh, you broke up for a second, but I think I got the question. Uh, I don't have anything to sell. I don't, I don't have any interest <laughs> in making any money from any of this, but uh, if you want to occasionally follow the uh, a few random things I might say, uh, I have a Twitter and it's uh, at G-Man Poker, G-M-A-N Poker. That's it. Awesome. Thank you guys uh, so much for being here. Thank you, Garrett, for sharing. Um, would encourage you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the Forcing Function newsletter. Uh, we do these lunch hours with amazing guests uh, once a month. So if you stay in, stay in touch, you can let, we can let you know when the next lunch hour is going to be. Uh, just a reminder, we're going to be sending all of you guys the recording of this conversation on uh, Monday. So keep an eye out for an email there. Um, if you have any additional questions for uh, myself or Garrett, um, feel free to reply to that email and I'll make sure they get to the uh, right place. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, signing off. See you guys next month. Thanks, Garrett.